Welcome back aboard Arabella. This week, the boat begins its trip south to Cape Cod, with a short hop back to Rockland, Maine, where the boat will get hauled out and get some work done. With the sails and rig largely ready for travel, Steve took a day to get the diesel heater up and running, which meant installing the fuel filler through the deck and its exhaust pipe through the housetop above the unit. We can't get your paws on this stuff. Morning light coming through a frozen hatch. Winter's here. With the stovetop all hooked up now, it was easier for Robin to wake up and start her routine, which today involved a new freshly delivered AeroPress. I've had an AeroPress forever. What makes AeroPress so delicious is that the, the, like the bitterness is stripped out of the coffee. So it's just this very full bodied flavor. It's great. It's super lightweight. It's really compact. I used it uh, camping and rock climbing forever. And now it's the perfect addition to our sailboat. It's like a French press only better. And it's the only press that uses three in one technology to brew thousands of recipes that have earned it 55,000 five star reviews around the world. AeroPress is already affordable for less than 50 bucks, but there's an offer for our audience. Visit AeroPress.com slash Acorn, that's A-E-R-O-P-R-E-S-S dot com slash Acorn, and save up to 20%. Have better mornings with better coffee. AeroPress ships to the USA and over 60 countries around the world, and we thank AeroPress for sponsoring our show. After cutting and fitting the exhaust pipe, Steve spent the evening dialing in the heater, which turned out to heat the space and the boat very well on its own. But a few spots got a little bit too hot, so there was a little more to do on this project the next morning. So this is cement board, and this is what we put behind the wood stove and behind the tile around the diesel heater. And I need to insulate the deck from the diesel heater so this is Hardy Backer cement board, and this stuff is a good insulator and it's non-flammable. So it's pretty perfect for what we need to do. It's not gonna be the prettiest at the moment, but eventually we'll throw a couple pieces of tile on the face and I have some sheet metal to put underneath uh, and it'll make it all look nice and prim and pretty. But for right now, this will help us keep the boat from getting caught on fire. And I need like less than half this board, but this is the size it comes. So it seems like we're putting in a ton of fiberboard, but we are not. Got my cement board cut for the overhead here. 
I got the diesel stove fired up yesterday. We scorched that deck beam there, which is not something we want to be doing. <laughs> so this stove pipe was pretty close to it. And you can see the top of the surround here used to touch the top of the beam or the bottom of the beams. So I dropped the whole shebang that far. So that get us, got us a bit more room. But even the overhead up here got really hot. So we're gonna put a piece of cement board up there with some spacers behind it and uh, make sure that that doesn't happen again. Cause we wanna be able to get this thing cranking and not burn the boat down. And I made some little cement board washers. I put all the screws in and taped them so that everything's pinned. And I should be able to lift this up in there, take off the tape one at a time and drive those screws in, but we will see. It was the last evening before setting off for Rockland, and Steve moved the boat over to a nearby boatyard so that he could top off the batteries. The issues with the alternator will get resolved later, so a rare hookup to shore power was needed. So when Nigel came and helped us with the electrical, we had to kind of unhook everything, and we lost our state of charge. So right there, it should tell us what percentage of the battery bank we have remaining which when you live off a battery bank like we do, it's, it's pretty important to know where that's at. So the way to get that back is to fully charge. And it's pretty sunny out, but the sun's real low, so we're not getting much solar. So we've moved the boat over to Lyman Moors, which is very close to where we've been in Camden. Well, it's in Camden, just very close to where we've been up, tied up to the dock. And we are plugged into shore power. So we've got a little over a thousand watts coming in from there. We've got a little bit of DC load since we're still living on the boat, the fridge is running and stuff, but we are gaining over 900 watts into the battery bank. So hopefully this won't take too, too long and we will see a hundred percent here and we'll have our readout back and that will be very nice because for the last little bit we've been just guessing and um, that gets a little concerning. Dead reckoning electric is tough for her the, uh, the longer you go without having a gauge. And that did it. So we uh, had the AC input there, charged it for, I don't know, I think it probably took like six hours or so, and we hit 100% and our charge came back on. Woohoo! It's nice to know how much the batteries have. The moon is super bright through the hatch tonight. Look at that. It's like someone shining a spotlight in here. And we're tied up to the dock, not afloat. And the uh, bumpers are squeaking. Sounds like the boat's farting. I like a glove, babe. All right, I'm gonna get the solar panels broken down. All right. Well, I can bring this stuff up later. We can just make a pile of stuff that's going up. All right. We're about to take off from Camden. And we're gonna head down to Rockland today. We just went down and scoped out the dock space down there um, so we can get down to the, what's it called, the travel lift? Travel, travel lift? lift, yep. Yeah, for, so we'll go spend the weekend in Rockland 
And then Monday got hauled with the new anode on. And then yep. we go, oh, we're going to go to the Cape. We're going to go to my homeland. It's where I grew up. I spent the last couple of years living out in Western Mass with Steve and pretty excited to go show him where I grew up and all the little special nooks and crannies on the Cape that were special to me growing up. Got all the stuff safely tucked away in the sink. I think we're, I think we have a little bit of stuff left to do up on deck, but we should be pretty much ready to go. Yeah, we're not going far and we're not leaving the bay, but we do want to make sure that if we get out there and it's rocking and rolling a little bit, or we decide to put the sails up and are healing some that yeah. the interior isn't getting tossed. So I'm going to finish tucking the cargo net up, but everything's tucked away on the workbench. And things are pretty much stowed and put away. Diesel heater still going. Got a little sooty. I got to clean the uh, clean the glass off. Before we left for New Mexico, we had the rig failure on the jib. I got everything put back together, but I didn't get it tightened before we left. Uh, and then I bumped into Stu at the climbing jib, which is wild. I haven't seen him since we were steam bending frames and he was the main chef for our pig roast. Uh, saw him at the gym and he came by to see Arabella and he gave me a hand to get the jib put on. And one of the things that we never did when we put the jib on, even initially, was get the furler line run. So if I pull on this black line, you'll see that the drum and that sail up there move. And that's what this line does. It winds that jib up. So I installed that little stand-up block on the bowsprit so that it had a nice lead out the center of the drum and wasn't rubbing on the drum housing. And I'm running it back kind of parallel as close to the whiskers for the bowsprit as I can. And that's getting it out of the way of the anchor. And that's making it so that there's just a pair of lines here to think about and there isn't like a line way in or way out. And then I need to direct this line, ideally, back to the cockpit. So I'm going to run it through the gap in the tow rail here with this low friction ring. So this is just, I believe, anodized aluminum. And it slides very easily, and it's grooved to take a lashing. So as I was playing around and figuring out where this wanted to be, I was just using this piece of parachute cord. And now we're gonna actually lash them in with some 1 8 inch Dyneema. I want this line to run close to the house and I want it to not rub on the block for the sheet. So I put in a tiny little pad eye here and we're gonna lace this low friction ring to that. I'm just gonna take this and lace it around a whole bunch of times. All right, so now we have that laced around. And as you can see, this, would, this ring would just pop right out. But now what we do is come back around and whip it. And I'll just hitch it back off to the pad eye here. Dyneema is slippery stuff, so we're gonna put in a whole bunch of hitches. And then that way it's easy to inspect. And if I notice that this suddenly has a couple inches of tail when it didn't, it still should have a whole bunch of hitches left over. So it should be very noticeable before it becomes any sort of issue. So I'll do the same thing up forward. I think we might have some sporty sailing conditions today, Robin. I think we might. <laughs> Keep getting these gusts. Yeah, they're coming off the land though, so hopefully the, the sea state should be pretty mild, which would be really nice. Yeah. It'd be awesome if there were no waves and good wind. And I gotta do a little bit of research on like how to lash these a little more properly. Like I'm, I'm quite positive that this will hold for a significant amount of time, but I'm also quite positive there's a slightly better way to do this. And uh, 
I'm sure some of you have ideas on what that is. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can pull this pit maneuver. Let's, let's see. Why don't you just hop on, grab that line, just hop on. Okay. All right, we're out of here. All right. All right, so we are in neutral. And I'm just basically letting the wind spin us around. It's beautiful. Look at the geese! storm. chasing. Things are calming down out there. Not quite as rowdy as it was. So initially we were tied right up here with the bow state facing us and the stern facing out towards the waves. And before the storm hit, most of the fishing boats that were here, you can see there's still one left, they all vacated and headed for the other side uh, to get away from the wind. So they went on the lee of some buildings that are over there. But it was pretty shallow and we were a little anxious trying to get Arabella in there. So since everyone left, our solution was to spring Arabella out. So this is the side the wind was coming from. So you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines tying Arabella over to the dock. And then on the other side, there's three lines that are holding Arabella across to the dock on the other side. And what this is doing is it's giving us a gap between Arabella and the docks. So our fenders actually never even 
touch during the storm. We were like one or two feet away and the docks were going up and down and the boat was bouncing all around, but we weren't slamming into the dock, which is what we were trying to avoid doing. Hey, Akiva. Hold on. And here we go in the stern. See, we've got one, two, three lines Woo! all holding us back here. We hauled Victoria out and tied her down to the dock so that she wasn't getting all beaten up. Oh, oh snap. We have some repairs to do. All right, so here is one of our lines We're running from the stern. And we actually lost a piece of our tow rail. That ripped right out, I just noticed that. Well, <laughs> that sucks. So that was our midship line. And then up here is our stem line. So you can see where it off here. And we're running across and we're holding the boat off the docks. So this worked really well. Um, this is not a tactic to do when it's busy because obviously we strung three lines across this and blocked this whole thing off so nobody else could come in. Um, but we did that after dark, right before the storm came, after everybody else left and we've kept an eye out and now that it's calmed down we're gonna pull ourselves back over to the dock and open this up, try to be respectful and courteous. But if there's nobody around and you're a place you can do it, getting pulled off the dock a little bit is advantageous. Can't believe we ripped the tow rail out, that sucks. Yeah, hold on Kiva. So, I'm gonna go release those stern line and get Arabella tied back up tight to the dock here. Now that things are calm. So if you notice the way these spring lines here are pulling, it's pulling out here a bit, but most of its strain is in line. So this is pulling against here, but most of the force is coming back. So it's putting this cleat you know, in shear, and same thing with these beams. So this is, bouncing around and handling this no problem. What we had on the other side was the line was attached to the cleat and came through and went straight out. So it was pulling totally outwards on this. Uh, but it ended up snapping that right off on the other side. Here it is. So we had a full blown failure of the oak. Snapped them right off. But the line held and our cleat held. Our tow rail brackets held. So this sucks, I'm not thrilled, but it's not a humongous deal. It's a relatively simple fix. I've got patterns for everything. And uh, 
It's part of the reason I did the tow rails this way, so that if something like this happened, if we got pinned under a dock, if another boat hit us, you know, they're, they're real easy to, to scarf in a new piece and round it out and put some oil on it and kind of never even really know what happened. You know, if these had been pinned down to the deck, we would have risked damaging the covering board and they would be a lot harder to replace. Same thing if it was some beautiful varnished what you may have it, it would be a, it'd be tough, but having them oak and having them oiled and having them bolted on the way they are, it's pretty easy to fix. I'll just take out one, two, three, four bolts, scarf, scarf, glue in a new piece, and then just cut out a new one there, grind the rivets out, and I have everything we need to do this on board, I believe. So, we're gonna, we're gonna get to work. Thanks for watching today, and we'd love a like and follow if you think we deserve it, so go hit those buttons. Come back next Friday to see what Arabella looks like below the waterline after almost six months in the water. And if you're watching this the Friday it comes out, our live stream today will be a little bit earlier than usual at 2 p.m. here in the eastern U.S., where these days the sun is going down at 4 p.m. Live streams are available to our Patreon members, and this week the stream will be open to members at all levels. So check the link in the description and come join us for the live. <laughs>